Book 13 begins the story of the San Graal. And I think first and foremost, it's important to clear up what the San Graal is or what it represents. San simply means saintly or holy. Graal is the cup, the grail itself. And if we notice with the grail, it's almost always depicted as having gold colors, so it's associated with sun imagery and thus revivification, renewal, rejuvenation. It also has um, the imagery of the hourglass shape, and it's this hourglass shape which connects it immediately to uh, geometric perfection, because geometric perfection is also part of that that image of wholeness and completion in the San Graal. And another thing that the San Graal has is the connection to the image of the feminine, partly because of its beauty, partly because of its, um, its hourglass shape, which is an image that for, for generations women have cultivated, and partly also because it is uh, the image that women would carry around the table to bring to men. So throughout this section, and for our story, this is very closely tied up with heavenly perfection, especially as heavenly perfection is united to that martial thing that we see in the chivalric code. That chivalric code in our story is uniquely tied or married to the story of salvation. The, uh, the author here is not so much worried about the idea of how warfare conflicts with the the stories of peace uh, from the Bible, or he's not so worried about the poverty uh, message in the Bible versus wealth of the court. What he is worried about is the uniting of chivalric perfection, the strength of man and the chivalric ideal, united together with the ability to accomplish all that God designs and the perfection of human life. That's most readily seen in the person of Galahad, the son of, of, of Lancelot. Galahad is, in every way possible, the perfection of chivalry and the perfection of this holy and noble and virtuous ideal. Notice at the beginning of the story he's brought in by a, an old man, a hermit, who is himself, the hermit is a reduplication of that image of Merlin. He is the, the old, wizened, wise man who has seen the world. And he comes into the court and immediately he takes the seat of the siege perilous, Remember around the round table, there are all these seats, and one seat is empty, and it is a seat where the man who will accomplish the grail story is going to sit, and anybody else who sits there is going to be killed. And there are letters that are on the seat that say, nobody sits here except for the guy who's going to accomplish the grail. And when Galahad comes to court, those letters change, and they become uh, something to the effect of, this is the seat of Galahad. So that from the very start, just the moment he walks into the court, What's Galahad going to do? He's going to achieve the grail. He's going to unite that martial thing, that, that, um, that ability to uh, uh, have that martial power of chivalric action, unite it with the Christian message of salvation. And in that way, he will become the Christ. And one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're reading this is that all this is symbolic language. The author is not here striving for realism as we're used to it in novels. You know, ever since the 1700s, we're used to novels looking like the real world around us and, and copying the real world around us. Mallory's not really doing that. He's creating a symbolic language, colors and numbers and names and actions, all which represent something. And much like that dream that we saw earlier, uh, interpreting with the dragon and the, uh, and the lion, interpreting it as symbolic of something else, so too the story of the San Grail and of the men who accomplished the San Grail is a highly charged symbolic story. Everything that happens in it represents something, is symbolic of something else. Notice the first thing that's symbolic is that Galahad comes into the court and he's going to achieve the Grail. And so nobody says, oh, uh, well, we shouldn't try because you're going to do it. No, they, all of them say, well, let's all go to achieve the Grail. Notice that the first knight to suggest that they go on the Grail store is Gowan. And this is highly ironic because Gowan's the most earthly knight you can imagine. But as the story goes, uh, there is this first miracle of the sword and the stone. Um, Arthur is going to go to dinner and Kai says, don't you want to wait until a miracle occurs? Because that's your habit, is to wait until a miracle occurs before you eat. Same thing we see in the story of Gowan and the Green Knight, for instance. Uh, 
And Arthur says, yeah, yeah, I'll wait, I'll wait. And then, boom, there's a miracle. We know there's a miracle going to come because that's Arthur's custom. And the miracle here is of a stone and a, 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 a block of stone floating in the water and the sword is in the stone and only the best knight can draw it out. Notice the block is, is, is red in color and that the sword itself is floating in the water. Again, what could that mean? Why red? Why a block of stone? Why not an anvil in this case? One or the other, this is a reduplication of the original sword in the stone. Sword in the stone occurs, right, and that's the founding of the Arthur lineage. It's reduplicated in the lady who comes in with the sword that can't be drawn and Balin draws it. And here we have it again. The best knight only can draw this sword out. And Arthur, who sees this miracle, says we need to draw this sword out because it will prove that we have the court with the best knights. So Lancelot, you do it. Lancelot, who I think is one of the most intriguing characters in this whole Grail story, says, I'm not the best knight. I can't do it. Which shows something's changed in him. I think that the whole experience of the madness and the, and the recovery has changed Lancelot in relationship to the Grail. So that he now thinks of himself as not the best knight, not able to do this. But Arthur with adamant says, well, Gowan, you do it. And so Gowan does or tries to. And because he can't pull it out now, he curses himself and he's going to be hurt later on. What could this mean? What does all this mean? This drawing the sword out of the stone, does it mean possibly have anything to do with the idea of the founding of civilization? Is this an image that has to do with uh, the relationship between men and women? Is this a, 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 another image of the grail? Notice that there's a high chance that the sword in the stone is like the grail story. And of course, who does succeed at pulling the sword out of the stone? It's Galahad. Galahad succeeds at it, just as he's going to succeed at the Grail, which indicates to us that there's a connection between Grail and what that symbolizes and the sword and what that symbolizes. And further on down the road, we'll see the similar thing with the shield, that, that Galahad goes to get a shield and another knight tries to use it and he gets hurt very, very badly and everybody says, well, you never should have done that. It's Galahad's shield. So the, the shield and the sword and the grail are all related here because only Galahad can, can succeed at them. Well, if only Galahad can succeed, why do the other knights go on the quest? Why are they all trying to succeed at the grail quest, knowing full well that Galahad is the only one who can do it? And why, for that matter, is Gawain the most earthly and reckless and, and um, rather uh, hot-headed uh, knight, why is he the first one to suggest that they all go on the quest, because he is. 